Hello, welcome to today's webinar covering nearly everything you wanted to know about pneumatic control, sponsored by Proportion Air. I'm Rachel Bassini, Senior Editor of Fluid Power World. I'd like to thank our audience for attending this talk and our presenters, Dave Harvey, John Lister, and Hammond Willey for being with us today. Proportion Air has been around since 1985, making the highest quality electro-pneumatic electro control products in the industry. The company's manufactured products are made to order, customize exactly to your specifications. In addition to electro-pneumatic parts, they also have a line of industrial process regulators, Berlin valves. If you're looking for a simple way to reduce pressure going to a tool or a compressed air system, they distribute the Protect Air line brand of miniature regulators in the U.S. They'll celebrate 38 years in business later in 2023. The ISO 9001 manufacturing operations are just east of Indianapolis, Indiana, a sales office in Groves, Texas, and an R&D sales and administrative location in Gulf Breeze, Florida in the Panhandle. Before we begin, let's review some ON24 housekeeping items so that you can participate in today's presentation. On the ON24 console, you'll see a number of boxes that you can move and resize to fit your preference. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, use the help box at the bottom of your screen or in the Q&A box to message us directly. If you have any questions for the presenters, please type them into the Q&A box. We'll answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Afterwards, our presenters can reach out to you directly with any remaining questions. There are several resources that accompany today's webinar that can be downloaded from the resource box on your console. You can also find direct contact information for your presenters and me in the Meet Your Speakers box. Feel free to share information from today's webinar on social media. Please tweet or post about it with the hashtag FluidPowerWebinar. Now I'm happy to present our presenters. Dave Harvey is an electrical engineer at Proportion Air. He can track his interest in engineering all the way back to age five when he received his first electric train set, and he hasn't stopped experimenting since. He served in the U.S. Navy, where he ultimately became a surface ship nuclear propulsion, propulsion plant supervisor, reactor controls. Dave celebrated 30 years of Proportion Air in 2022. John Lister is Proportion Air's Manager of Technical Development. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of West Florida. John has been with the company for more than 10 years, moving from electrical engineering to his current role where he leads a team of engineers researching and developing new products and improving existing products. He works in the company's Florida location. Hammond Willey is a specialist for the Berlin valve line. His experience with Berlin predates Proportion Air's acquisition of the brand, going back 11 years. He answers all of your questions about industrial process control and more from the Groves, Texas location, east of Houston. We are so grateful to have all three of you here today. Hammond, I'll turn the microphone over to you so we can get started. Thanks, Rachel. I'm Hammond Willie, and I'll be sharing my knowledge as well as moderating the conversation. To get everyone thinking this morning, we're going to start with something fun, pneumatic trivia. Which of these was the first commercially successful application of pneumatic control? Select the answer you think is correct. It may take a minute for all the answers to come in, so we'll share uh, the answer at the end of the presentation. All right, if you're with us today, we know you're interested in pneumatic control. We've titled this session nearly because some of the topics we'll touch on could be webinars on their own. We hope that you'll come away with a better understanding of what to look for when making decisions about pneumatic control. But why pneumatics? Dave Harvey knows a thing or two about some of the basic pros and cons of pneumatic, hydraulic, and electromechanical controls. Dave, enlighten us. Thanks, Hammond. The alternatives to pneumatic control are hydraulic and electromechanical. Each has its pros and cons. At first, I'll contrast hydraulic and pneumatic together versus electromechanical since hydraulic and pneumatic systems are very similar. Generally, an electromechanical system is more accurate. That is the major reason to use an electromechanical solution. An example would be on a CNC mill. 
Typical pneumatic and hydraulic systems are not as precise. Other differences contribute to the decision to choose pneumatic, hydraulic over electromechanical. In pneumatic and hydraulic, the working fluid is compressed and stored. The energy conversion occurs remotely from the process that is being controlled, and so the heat generated is also remote to the load. Contrast this to an electromechanical system where the power dissipation occurs in the motor or actuator at the load. The heat at the load must be dealt with. Additionally, electromechanical components are larger and more expensive than their equivalent hydraulic counterparts for the same power delivery. These factors should be taken into consideration when choosing how to control your process. If electromechanical is not suitable, the pneumatic or hydraulic are the options. They each have good and bad characteristics depending on what you want to do. Here are some of them. The main benefit for hydraulic is hydraulic fluid is non-compressible. You can deliver a substantial amount of power to the load. It is also fast acting and adds a pneumatic the source of power and load can be separated. The drawbacks of hydraulic, hydraulic fluid is not very friendly. It's messy and flammable. And most hydraulic fluids are hygroscopic. That means that they can absorb moisture that will cause internal corrosion and contamination of the hydraulic system, leading to performance issues and component failure. Leakage can also cause a mess. It seems like dirt and grime are always attracted to it, and it's also a fire hazard. Temperature range may be limited due to a changes in viscosity or fluid degradation due to heat. And for pneumatic, we also have some good and bad. For the pneumatic system, any inert gas may be used. And in general, leakage does not cause a mess or a fire hazard if you're using a non-combustible gases. Pneumatic leaks, you know, something you put a little leak check on there and you get some bubbles, it's really kind of bothersome, but it doesn't really present a safety hazard. The source of power, and on pneumatics, the source of power load can also be separated. You can operate loads in a hazardous classified environment this way. An example would be in a paint booth. Air is used to pilot the paint fluid regulator, and it's also used to pilot the fan air and shaping air regulators. Another thing with pneumatics versus hydraulic is gases are compressible, and this allows some inherent shock absorption in your process. Uh, some issues with pneumatics are gases are compressible, so it takes the time to build up some pressure to do whatever it is you want to do. Also, the compressibility limits the amount of power that you can actually deliver to the load. You need a lot more air to do the same kind of work as a hydraulic solution. Also, pressure boundary failure can cause significant damage. Compressed gas will continue to flow at a high velocity jet until the system pressure equalizes with the atmosphere. A closed pressure high, a closed pressurized hydraulic system that does not have any trapped air will immediately equalize with the atmosphere when the pressure boundary is compromised. Now, if the power unit is still on, you're still going to have some flow of pressure. But regardless, um, it's generally not as hazardous as uh, pneumatic rupture. Regarding bottle gas, it is stored at a much higher pressure than most pneumatic systems. This stored energy also has its hazards. A rupture on the regulator or the top of the gas wall can be catastrophic, since it tends to become a missile projectile and cause great damage and great harm to us flesh and blood types. There are a few other differences between hydraulic and pneumatic. The infrastructure for hydraulic and pneumatic systems differ mainly because the hydraulic system is normally localized on a, an assembly or a machine, whereas a pneumatic system would have a distribution system throughout a facility that can uh, be routed to many machines. The practice, the possibilities here are practically endless, but in general, pneumatics is used when air or compressed gas is available and priorities that are, the process is fast, clean, repeatable, and the power of hydraulic is not needed. Thanks for that overview, Dave. Today, we're just talking about pneumatics. And one of the fundamental aspects of pneumatics is the industrial compressed air system. Dave, can you explain what it takes for air to go from your, the compressor to your application? Sure. You hear us talk a lot about air during this presentation. It's just a force of habit, but it also applies to most compressed gases. 
The compressor for the bottle gas is your power source with the energy being stored as pressure energy in the system, which consists of the receiver and the distribution piping. If you're using bottle gas, then the gas is already compressed and you won't need a compressor. Unless you're using something other than air, an on-site compressor is generally the less expensive a way to go and operate instead of bottled gas. Air compressors draw in air from the surrounding atmosphere and they compress the air to increase its pressure and density and that's usually stored in some type of receiver or pressure vessel. The compression process is usually powered by an electric motor. There are also several types of air compressors. The type used is dependent on the pressure and volume that you require. Positive displacement compressors using pistons make up the majority of general use compressors out there. These compressors may or may not have oil lubrication. For a higher volume application, a rotary screw compressor may be used, or if you're at low pressure or vacuum and you need a lot of volume, you could use a blower. Like mentioned earlier, an on-site compressor usually gets its supply air from the surrounding environment. Any particulate matter and moisture will also be introduced into the system by the compressor. These contaminants can adversely affect the cleanliness and operation of the pneumatic system and its loads. If the compressor uses oil, this also must be prevented from contaminating the distribution system. It's also recommended to, at a minimum, minimum have a filter and oil water separator. If clean, dry air is needed, which is almost always, then the addition of an air dryer is needed. Of course, bottled gases have had these purification steps performed to the extent needed for the rate or for the rate of gas that is provided. Moving on, filtration and pressure regulation is generally also needed at the point of load to remove contaminants and corrosion from products in the distribution system and limit the air pressure available to the load to the required level. A typical point of load setup will consist of an isolation valve, a filter, and a pressure regulator. If your load requires lubrication, such as in an air motor, an additional lubricator can be placed downstream of the filter regulator block. These are commonly known as FLR blocks or filter regular length filter regulator lubricator blocks. Some systems may also benefit from a, some form of inline safety regulator downstream to protect against ruptures or blow off injuries. If you haven't noticed, the one thing missing in our diagram is a safety relief valves. These are required to protect against overpressure in the system. Dave. You've mentioned regulators a couple of times, and I heard valve. Now, I know that our very own burling valves are actually a line of regulators. We hear customers use these terms interchangeably. Is there a difference, and what is it? You're right, Hammond. The term regulator and valve are often used interchangeably uh, in the industry. However, they actually perform different functions as well. A valve is really a very broad term, and there's a bunch of different types of valves. In fact, a regulator is also a valve, but a valve is not a regulator. In general, in general, a valve is a device that regulates and controls and directs the flow of a fluid, like air or water, by opening or closing or obstructing a channel or passageway. There's a variety of valve types, like globe, gate, ball, check, butterfly, and a lot more. Each are suited to particular applications. A regulator is a suspension. A regulator is a specific type of valve that controls flow or pressure and uses some type of feedback to maintain that flow or pressure. Another type of valve that is often compared to a regulator is a control valve, as shown on the left in the slide. This control valve is shown without a positioner. The main difference between a regulator and a control valve is a regulator is capable of regulation without any external hardware, and the control valve requires a positioner. A control valve positioner can be either pneumatic uh, mechanical or electronic. It's typically used to maintain the position of the valve based on a feedback signal from some external source to the positioner. For a pneumatically actuated control valve, the output of the positioner is a pneumatic signal. This comparison between a regulator and a control valve is common because the two are often used in similar type applications depending on the requirements. A control valve with a positioner performs the functions of a regulator but has specific features that make it a better choice in some systems than a regulator. Generally, a control valve is not used to control air or inert gases but is more suited for high temperature gases like steam or potentially nasty process fluids. Since the actuator portion is separate from the actual valve itself, different materials construction 
and for the seals and uh, elastomers that are compatible to the process media in the valve portion, while you can use least expensive seals and materials on the actuator. And if you're piloting with air, that's even better. This is also particularly true to separate these if you have special alloys also required to be compatible with your materials or media. Uh, also, control valves may have a special valve and seat geometries not found in a regulator, such as an equal percentage or parabolic seat. These can be useful to aid in flow control. Other considerations come into play as well. Regulators can have an exhaust or function or not. A leg regulator with an exhaust function will relieve air if the work pore pressure is too high. Not all regulators have an exhaust function. Control valves do not have an exhaust function. One additional difference is that the main valve in most regulators is a globe style valve. In a control valve or process valve, any of the valve types such as globe, gate, or ball may be used with the appropriate actuator. Also, if you want a throttle flow, you need a globe valve or a needle valve. Ball, butterfly, or check valves and gate valves are not suitable for flow throttling unless they have a specific design. So you've mentioned there are countless types of valves. From my experience, there are many types of regulators. And like valves, we're not going to describe them all. The three main types of regulators we're highlighting here are manual, dome loaded, and electronic. A manual regulator is a mechanical regulator, usually operated with an adjusting screw or hand wheel to change pressure, but it can also be set to a single set point. The BS in the upper left, the regulator at the top right, and the safety regulators at the bottom right are examples of manual regulators. Another type, similar to the manual regulator, is the dome loaded or pilot operated regulator. These devices require a pilot to load pressure into a dome above the diaphragm to provide control. The working gas and the pilot gas can be different. The assembly in the bottom left shows a dome loaded regulator in the center. Finally, an electronic regulator comprises the pilot and the regulator in a single unit or assembly. It operates via instruction from an electronic control source like a voltage or current command or various digital protocols. They may be open or closed loop, which we'll cover in a few minutes. The green and gray device in the middle of the slide is one of our QB4 electronic regulators. Let's dig a little deeper and talk about specifically how a regulator might be controlled. A direct acting regulator is a valve that operates with a simple spring and diaphragm design to control a set pressure. The BS regulator on the left is an example. Dome loaded regulators, also called pilot operated regulators, like the BD on the right, use a fluid pressure, normally air, on top of the diaphragm to provide the set pressure instead of the spring. We would typically recommend using a dome loaded regulator when high accuracy is required and pilot air source is available. I'm going to pause for a minute and we'll throw out a poll question. Feel free to click on the option on your screen that best answers the question for you. The first thing we're curious about this morning is how long you've been in manufacturing. We'll give a little time to answer these, and since there's a bit of a lag as the answers come in, we'll include the results in our follow-up email. Thanks for those answers. Coming back to our pneumatic control topic, the regulator type we've not heard much about yet is electro pneumatic. John, how about you jump in here and tell us more about these devices? Thanks, Hammond. 
Electro-pneumatic control is the combination of electronics and pneumatics uh, using compressed air or using electronics to control compressed gases and air. There's many different electro-pneumatic components, but they all work under the same general principles of using an electronic signal to control pneumatic output. The simplest electro-pneumatic control mechanism is a voice coil activated valve, like the drawing on the screen. These devices operate by passing a current, which is typically 4 to 20 milliamps, but could be more, through a coil of wire acting against a magnet that positions a flapper nozzle valve. The opening of the flapper nozzle is more or less proportional to the current. These devices typically have no feedback and they're considered open loop devices. They are often referred to as regulators, however technically they're not since they inherently lack a feedback mechanism. Tell us more about open loop devices, and I'm assuming there must be closed loop as well? Yeah, there's two main types, the open loop and closed loop, like you said. Uh, different applications benefit from different control types. A good example of open loop is that 4 to 20 milliamp flapper nozzle type unit we mentioned before, where the percent open is proportional to the 4 to 20 milliamps without regard to the pressure. A system with open loop control like this doesn't have a feedback mechanism. For example, a signal sent to device like an I to P or E to P regulator indicating a specific desired pressure output. Without an onboard sensor or other feedback mechanism, this command signal is the sole driver for the correct pressure being achieved. The loop is there. <clears throat> the loop is open. There is no other affirmation. There are applications where this is acceptable, like when a precise, repeatable result isn't necessary, and as long as the task is achieved, the result is okay. But when you need to confirm that the desired output was achieved, you need a closed loop regulator. Closed loop control includes a feedback mechanism. In the case of our electro-pneumatic regulators, like the QPV you see in the microfluidics application on screen, a single loop feedback system relies on an internal sensor and a double loop on an external transducer load cell or some other device. So uh, next let's expand on the single and double loop ideas. Again, single loop device pressure output is measured by an internal pressure transducer. This provides a feedback signal to the electronic controls, which then compare the feedback to the command signal input. Uh, as you see here in this image, the QBX is a single loop device relying on the internal transducer for feedback. Any difference causes a valve to open, allowing flow into or out of the system. In a double loop system, an additional external transducer measuring pressure or another process variable may be used. The external device serves as the primary feedback signal, comparing the output to the command signal input. Double loop is one of our specialties. There are many scenarios where the second loop is useful. Uh, for example, when piloting a dome-loaded regulator, which has hysteresis, the attrition of the external control loop allows the assembly to overcome the mechanical hysteresis and maintain a more accurate delivery pressure. So we just mentioned how the feedback causes the valve to open. We're going to slow down here and show how the air moves through our QBX unit. Our animation shows air movement through the QBX. When both valves are closed, there is no change. When given a higher pressure command, the inlet valve on the left opens and an output pressure is provided. The inlet valve closes when the pressure set point is achieved. With a lower set point command, the exhaust valve on the right opens and the output pressure relieves to atmosphere.
Thanks, John. Let's hear about some other electronic regulator features. A more advanced electronic regulator will have a pressure sensor to measure the output pressure. The regulator will provide electronic feedback to a control, uh, control circuit that modulates solenoid valves, which maintains a fixed pressure output proportional to the command or set point signal. This type of regulator will often have additional features not possible on other control methods. Features like an electronic signal representative of the actual condition of the output, as whether this is pressure or flow, uh, various fail-safe options, such as fail to atmosphere on loss of electrical power. They may have automatic error and fault detection. Uh, feedback may be something other than pressure or flow, uh, and it may be provided through a PLC by some other process variable, uh, such as temperature, force, torque, speed, size, displacement, things like that. Feedback device may be remote to the electronic regulator. Uh, using electronic feedback allows real-time sensing of a remote process variable without the additional plumbing and potential time delay for a pneumatic signal to travel from the process all the way back to the feedback device. So that's how it works. What are some of the advantages? As with most engineering approaches, there's pros and cons to all kinds of control systems. The most common advantage of using electro-pneumatic control system covers the cost, the maintenance, the power distribution, weight and size, cleanliness, leak effect mitigation, and safety. The largest cost in most electro-pneumatic control systems is the compression and treatment of the air. This is offset by the ability to easily distribute this power compared to hydraulics. A single compressor can supply multiple machines with compressed air, while hydraulics and electronics typically need at least one prime mover per machine. This also reduces the maintenance cost, as well as the overall weight and size of the control system, especially per machine. In many applications, such as the food industry, uh, cleanliness is a really big advantage. If you have a hydraulic leak that spills fluid on a batch of food, the food is ruined. Uh, if you have a leak in the pneumatic system, food should be perfectly fine. Uh, due to the compressible nature of pneumatics, these systems are much less affected by a leak than a system that's based on hydraulics. Uh, lastly, a leaky air line makes little to no mess compared to a leaky hydraulic line. Uh, this reduces safety-related issues like slip and falls or flammability or a whole long list of things. Uh, in the past, there were some big disadvantages to electro-pneumatics, and the, the two biggest ones were accuracy when compared to electromechanical and power when compared to hydraulics. Uh, with the higher quality electronic pressure regulators, especially ones that allow for remote sensing that provides electronic feedback, the accuracy disadvantage is eliminated. Some of the electro-pneumatic control systems are rated to 7,500 PSI or higher which shrinks the gap between the maximum hydraulic power and the maximum pneumatic power. So now we know the advantages. What more can you tell us about the components? There's three main components in the electro-pneumatic control system. Um, you can see all of them here on the screen. The electronic controller, the monitor and the electro pneumatic device. The electro pneumatic device does the work while the controller acts as a sort of an HMI to tell the electro pneumatic device what work to perform. Then the monitor indicates that the device is working properly. Beyond that, there's many different pneumatic actuators and various sensors that can be, an inclu be included in an electro pneumatic control system. A volume booster paired with a downstream pressure transducer can be added and this will control the temperature when using saturated steam, like what you're seeing here on screen. An air motor combined with an RPM counter can be added to control the speed of a feeder, or a cylinder with a linear transducer can be added to control distance. In addition to internal feedback, some of these electronic pressure regulators include a remote feedback input, uh, or that second loop input we talked about earlier that allows a more precise electro-pneumatic control for some applications. 
Thanks, John. Time for another poll question. As we talk about components and applications, think of your own search process. Choose which methods you use to find this information. Moving on, another basic pneumatic component is the solenoid valve. These can be used on their own and they're an integral part of many electronic regulators. John, what can you tell us? With a traditional solenoid valve, there's really only two states, open or closed. The fastest open shut cycle will move a certain amount of air. This could be too much air for the application, which would overfill whatever is downstream. With a proportional solenoid, you can modulate the percent opens, the percent that it opens, and you can move a smaller amount of air for greater resolution. It can operate at any percentage of openness depending on the current flowing through it. Uh, Dave, can you step in here real quick and describe what we're seeing on these slides? Sure, John. Shown in the illustration, we have the graphs response of two different valves. The one on the left is a traditional solenoid valve, and the one on the right is a proportional valve. As you can see on the left, as the current increases, you get to a point where the valve repositions open, and it does this very rapidly. After it's open, the poppet has moved, and the magnetic circuit of the valve is more efficient, so it does not take as much energy to hold the valve open as it did to open it. As we reduce the current, we can see this as the current goes to a lower value before the valve shuts. This is normal hysteresis of the valve and how a standard solenoid valve operates. For the valve on the right, the proportional valve, it's a little bit different. As we increase the, per the current, at some point the valve starts to open, and then as you continue to increase the current, the valve opens more. The percent open is basically more or less proportional to the amount of current. Again, it's more magnetically efficient at the top. So as you come down to current to shut the valve, it takes the path on the left. This is the standard hysteresis as we saw in this other valve. This is basically how a standard proportional valve works. It allows you to throttle very easily by modulating the current through the valve. Thanks, Dave. Because I'm an engineer and I like graphs, We'll move to another graphable topic next. The difference between analog and digital control we talk about involves the internal circuitry. Electronics as a whole falls into two major camps, the analog and digital. Analog signal has an infinite, has infinite data points between any two voltages. So the range between zero and one volts has an infinite number of data points, the same as analog signal between zero and 0 0.001 volts. A uh, digital signal has only two possible states, a logic one or a logic two, or logic zero, sorry. Uh, the digital electronics has to simulate analog performance by using many of these ones and zeros and combination. And this gives or receives an approximation of an analog signal. This means the accuracy of a digital system is limited by the number of these ones and zeros, which are called bits. So for example, a 12-bit system only has 4,096 discrete steps, whereas the analog system would have infinite steps. From a system standpoint, analog electronic pressure regulators requires an analog signal to command and puts out an analog monitor signal, while the digital electronic pressure regulators often accept serial communications from a control system or a computer. Historically, analog regulators outperformed digital by a large margin, but the digital technology has advanced significantly. As with any application, resolution, repeatability, and accuracy of individual regulators must be considered during product selection. Now we know some of the basics about how things work. Dave, let's come back to you. 
I know I'm in a perfect situation for pneumatic control. What do I need to know to make sure I'm choosing the best product for my application? Thanks, Hammond. When our applications team is configuring a pressure regulator for a customer, we may ask several questions. Because our products are customized for your application, we try to collect as much information as possible to get you the right device. Even if you're ordering a standard off-the-shelf product, knowing the answers to at least a few of these questions will make your choice easier. We'll start with a few simple ones. What's the media that you're gonna be using with the product? What's the units of measure, PSI, bar, torque? Also be ready to share the temperature of the media and the temperature of the environment. Other environmental factors can be useful to know as well. Where will your device be located? Is it near a power source, near air, inside or outside? Is your supply pressure? Uh, are you coming from your shop air system or bottled gas? And your full working pressure range desired for the unit. These are all critical information. For electronic units, what signals are you gonna control this with? There are many options. You can go with a basic four to 20 or zero to 10, or even some network ethernet protocols or proprietary protocols and software. Next, what are the accuracy requirements for the application? For an application where exactness isn't a big concern, like you're trying to regulate an AOGD pump in a factory, you know, say 5%, it's probably okay. But if you're trying to control fluid in a microfluidic channel, you're probably looking for an accuracy more like 0.5%. Even when you're trying to control pressure, understanding the flow conditions in your application is necessary. It's important to share even if the area downstream of your controller is under constant flow or will it be regulating pressure to a static volume. With that in mind, what workflow and exhaust flows do you, are you going to need? If you're moving small amounts of air and the amount of air consumed downstream is low, your flow needs may be negligible. However, if a lot of air is being consumed downstream, adding a booster may be necessary to deliver this volume. If you are regulating pressure to a static volume, what is the total downstream volume that's gonna be controlled and how fast do you need to fill it? Sometimes a regulator may meet all of your other criteria, but because of flow limits, it may take five minutes to fill a volume you like to fill in 50 seconds. Basically, if you have excess flow capacity, it's often desirous for a a successful application. In addition, what's the pipe or hose size that you are intending to use with the application? This is another piece of information that helps determine the flow needs and the sizing of the regulator. If you're able, offering an additional description or a schematic of your application can also help. Once our team has, has this information, they can use it to pick the right pressure product for you and to size it correctly for your flow requirements or CV. That CV requirement is another piece of information that's helpful on a dome loaded or direct acting regulator. Okay, you mentioned CV, which is a value representing the flow capacity of a pneumatic component. Using a sizing program with a CV calculator, we can determine the flow capacity a regulator would need for the application. This information helps us determine exactly what size regulator and CV rating is needed to properly handle the pressure and flow requirements. Now these questions were about pressure regulators. If it's a flow control device you're looking for, much of the basic information is similar, but you'll provide your desired flow control range. In short, the more of this information you can provide to a vendor, the better. It is less likely that you will be able to rely on the vendor's expertise if little or no information is available. Time for another poll question. You've heard about some components, and now we're curious. What are the most important factors to you when choosing a product? Please click on all of the answers that apply to you. We've been talking a lot about pressure, but you just heard us invite Flo into the party with those applications questions. John, can you help us clear up some terminology around flow monitors and flow controllers? Sure can, Hammond. 
A flow monitor is a type of sensor that measures airflow through a manifold. For our products, we generally have a 0 to 10 volt analog signal output that corresponds to the flow monitor's calibrated range. This allows you to receive the flow measurement as an electronic signal. Flow monitor, flow meter, and flow sensor are often used interchangeably. A flow controller is an assembly that consists of a flow monitor and a regulator. The flow monitor acts as a feedback into the regulator for proper control of the output. Some types of flow monitors are better suited for this than others, like a laminar flow element using differential pressure. Uh, on the other hand, thermal mass flow, while more accurate, is responding to easily integrate into a closed loop system. Now, you have a unit in place for pneumatic regulation. What kind of maintenance program should you expect? Keeping your regulators and loads working well requires keeping your entire compressed air system clean and working well. Some kind of maintenance program is definitely beneficial. A couple simple practices will help. Most are not hard. Say, when you come in first thing in the morning, if your compressor uses oil, check the oil level. You can drain your receiver tank and coalescing filter drain. Check the status of your air dryer. If you're using a desiccant type air dryer, you'll have a visual indicator showing the condition of the desiccant. A refrigeration type, uh, you'll have a dew point meter or something indicating the moisture content of the air. Make sure your system pressures are as expected. Listen to your compressor operate. If you notice it sounds different than normal, maybe time to check a few things on it. Elsewhere in the system, at the point of load, basically, uh, you know, you check for proper pressures, that your filters are drained, and that the inline lubricators, if you have any, have proper levels. These routine checks can prevent issues down the road and increase the reliability of the system and its loads. Also, as a side note, depending on your local requirements, some air system components, such as receivers and relief valves, may require an annual inspection or testing by an outside accredited body. In addition to the air system, regulators also need a maintenance schedule to ensure reliability. On the screen, you can see some of the results of improper regulator maintenance. Regulators are still mechanical devices subject to their own wearout mechanisms. Valve seals and elastomers can become worn and brittle over time. And if you don't have them uh, compatible with your media, the seals can uh, have geometric changes to their size by either the diffusion of the medium into the elastomer or by uh, some other chemical attack. Either of these can cause change in seals the, um, any of these can cause a change in seal geometry and strength leading to seal failure. For this reason, checking the compatibility of the seal with the media is a must. Electronic pressure regulators have their own maintenance requirements as well. In addition to the wetted parts and the elastomers mentioned above, an electrical distribution system and the power for a signal must also maintain. Also, an electronic pressure regulator may require periodic calibration checks to maintain the level of certainty required in the process. So you've got an EPR, but there's trouble. How do you fix it? Well, sometimes the situation is as clear cut as our friend Carl here has identified. But there are a few common failure mechanisms we can look at. Either the unit is non-responsive, not achieving pressure, it's slow to achieve pressure, or it's out of calibration. It can also be oscillating. First, we recommend che checking your external conditions. Hopefully, if you're following a maintenance program, you're not here very often. We always suggest to check your supply air or gas pressure. You know, this is a very common thing. You know, a valve was shut downstream and, and you were not aware of it. For many electronic regulator products, the optimum inlet pressure is about 10% above the output range, being careful not to exceed any specifications for the valve or sensor or any downstream loads. Inadequate supply pressure or insufficient capacity is a common cause of product underperformance. Other end of the hand, if you're Supply pressure is too high, you can have leaks and maybe damage internal sensors or downstream components. If your fluid supply pressure is good, 
the electrical interface is the next place to check. Confirm with a multimeter that you have your correct power supply and signals to the device that it requires to operate. If you've confirmed all your external conditions, now it's time to move on to the unit itself. Non-responsive can be caused by damage from miswiring, damage from internal sensors, or failure of internal electronic components. Always review the literature that comes with a product to make sure that everything has been wired properly. If you're using an external feedback device, an incompatible transducer could cause erratic or no operation. Always check for compatible signal types and ranges. Another mode of failure is oscillation. This is more of a system issue. It can also be caused by electromagnetic interference. But most times, if it's been working, you have a, either an inadequate downstream volume, you have leaks in the airline, fittings and things are leaking, your supply pressure has contaminants that's contaminated your internals, or that all of these can result in the unit failing to find the specific pressure. There are some behaviors in pneumatic systems that may exhibit, they're not necessarily seen with other control schemes may seem, that may seem at normal at first glance. When you're changing pressure, you may introduce thermodynamic effects on the process. Adding air to a reservoir does work on the air as it's compressed and into the reservoir and it is generating heat because of that compression. After your initial set point is achieved, the air is cooling in the reservoir causing the pressure to decrease which causes the regulator to continue to add small amounts of air to maintain the system pressure. This continues for a short period of time until thermal equilibrium is reached. Temperature changes in your process can also affect the pressure causing the regulator to operate to maintain set point. These are all normal phenomena and do not indicate a problem. Great info on troubleshooting an electronic unit. Let's talk about a mechanical regulator. On a mechanical regulator, overriding delivery pressure or failure of the main valve to close is generally a symptom of the spring being tampered with or the valve seat having debris. Readjusting the spring, cleaning, and replacing internal parts often solve this problem. Debris buildup on the stem and guiding passages can cause hunting. Again, Cleaning and replacing parts should solve the problem. Sagging delivery pressure or failure of the main valve to open is another possible observation. Just like on the electronic products or any pneumatic driven device, confirming an adequate supply pressure is important. Another potential cause is a sensing port being plugged. So clean as necessary. Many regulators also have rebuild kits which, which should be part of your regular preventative maintenance program. And now that we've hit rebuild kits, we're at the end of our formal presentation. We've covered systems, some terminology, pneumatic components, and how to take care of them, as well as some troubleshooting tips. The overall message we wanna leave you with the more information you know about your system, the better decisions you can make. It will also help your vendors provide you the perfect component to accomplish the job. Now, the answer to the trivia question from the top of the session. If you said pneumatic mail tube, you're correct. Pneumatic mail tubes were introduced in the U.S. Post Office in the 1890s. Nail guns came about in the 1950s, and Chuck E. Cheese had his first animatronic, elect, uh, animatronic characters in 1977. Congratulations to all who answered correctly, and thanks for listening to our pneumatic control presentation. If you have more questions or just want to reach out to us, you can find our contact information on the screen. All right. Thank you so much, Dave, John, and Hammond for this educational presentation. It's now time to answer some questions, so please submit them to the Q&A. 
The first question we have is, what about back pressure versus pressure reducing regulators? I, I can uh, actually amplify a little bit on that. If your system or process is producing pressure and you want to regulate it, you can use a back pressure regulator to relieve the excess and, and have regulation that way. Or also another common application is using a blower to draw vacuum. Since you really can't control the speed of the blower very economically, the best way to regulate that vacuum is to use back pressure. The back pressure regulator will introduce atmosphere into your system to maintain this the specific vacuum that you want. Okay, next question. What if my media is flammable? I'll do this one also. Uh, basically, your, your flammable gas or media, if it's contained within your pressure boundary or your piping system, it's not a problem. The, the issues arise if your system has a leak or say you're using a, a regulator that has a relieving function and it exhausts into that atmosphere. Introducing the flammable material into that atmosphere changes that into a hazardous classified location. Uh, there are units that are operated or certified for operation in hazardous classified oper uh, locations uh, if you need something like that. But uh, in general, uh, as long as you contain the fluid within your piping system, it's not an issue. Okay, great. All right, the third question we have is, what was the most interesting re uh, request that you've received? I don't know about most in interesting, but the most satisfying applications I've worked on were for water features. We've worked with several theme parks and um, casinos uh, around the world to provide some of these uh, extravagant water displays that you've seen on TV, movies, all kinds of places. Being able to see the end results in person, knowing you played a part and making that happen is extremely satisfying. I, I guess this is Dave again. Um, my most interesting one, uh, I suppose it involved a, a instrument bay on a telescope. Basically, we were controlling the pressure of nitrogen in this instrument bay that was filled with optical instruments. And the purpose of that was is they want to keep the nitrogen density and temperature and pressure all constant. Anyway, any, that way any variations will not affect their optical measurements. But that was pretty neat. Great. Looks like we have one more. Uh, at some point, someone mentioned a volume booster as part of a system, and it was on a drawing. Can you clarify what that is? I'll do that one. Um, a volume booster uh, goes by many names. The ones we're talking about are air piloted, um, dome regulators, pilot operated regulators, things like that. Um, from electronics background, it's kind of like an air transistor. So you're using a little bit of air, controlling a little bit of air on the top to control a whole lot more air uh, going through the valve. Okay. Well, it looks like that concludes the presentation for today. If you have additional questions, you can still enter them in the Q&A box and be contacted directly. Thank you everyone for attending this Fluid Power World webinar and to Dave, John, Hammond and Proportion Air for helping bring this excellent information to our audience. This presentation will be emailed to everyone later today and it'll also be available at fluidpowerworld.com. Thanks again for joining and make it a great day.